Right, Thursday nights we're going through the Old Testament book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and we are in the book of 1 Kings and chapter 2 tonight. You'll forgive my cloth, I'm not trying to do my impression of a television preacher. <laughs> I will try also to, no promises, but I will try uh, to not go too long given the... Uh, humidity and heat. Uh, this just makes us want our building, should the Lord tarry sooner, which will have air conditioning at a quarter of a million dollars, but we'll have air conditioning, so it'll be great. Um, last week in chapter one, we left David on his deathbed, and the last thing he needed on his deathbed was to have to deal with yet another one of his sons launching a rebellion against him. Thankfully though, David did deal with it. He dealt with it swiftly and wisely and he did so by appointing his son Solomon as heir to the throne and he did so knowing that he wasn't going to live very much longer. Indeed, he will uh, die tonight, I'm sorry to say. I don't know how else to say it that way. I have not been looking forward to chapter 2. Uh, I don't want David to die yet. Not yet. Um, Adonijah is the uh, son that has launched the rebellion. And at the end of chapter 1, we saw him on the receiving end of Solomon's mercy. Uh, Solomon was very gracious, very merciful to him. Uh, did not put him to death for his rebellion, though he could have justifiably. Uh, but tonight uh, we're going to see him, this is a spoiler alert, <laughs> uh, he will in fact try it again as we get towards the end of the chapter. So before we jump in, let's pray. We'll ask God's blessing on our time in his word tonight. Lord, thank you so much for your word and thank you for this chapter that we have open before us in our Bibles tonight. Lord, it's with great anticipation that we look forward to that which you have here for us, the lessons we can learn, the personal application to our lives that we can take home with us from this study, this time in your word. Lord, now as we begin our study of this chapter, would you really speak through your word into our lives and do so clearly, Lord. We want to not only be hearers of your word, we want to be doers as well. So Lord, speak. Your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's jump in. Verse 1. Now, the days of David drew near that he should die. And he charged Solomon his son, saying, verse 2, I go the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man. And, verse 3, keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and his testimonies as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn, that the Lord may fulfill his word which he spoke concerning me, saying, if your sons take heed to their way, to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, he said, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. David is referring to the promise that God gave him that he would be the one from whom the Savior of the world would come, from his lineage, from his throne. What we have recorded here are David's last words to his son Solomon. And actually we won't take the time to look at it tonight, but in First Chronicles chapter 28 and 29, 
we're provided with much more of a detailed account of what David's final words were to his son. Now, in our culture, this is not very well uh, understood because uh, we don't really understand what it was like, and even to this day, how important it was that before the father died, he would give the blessing to his son. Uh, Think uh, uh, Esau (laughs) and how he sold his birthright, that blessing to Jacob, who sort of conned him out of it, didn't need to. (laughs) Jacob would be the one whom God would bless indeed, but dad Isaac wanted to bless Esau and it was thwarted and Jacob ended up getting the blessing. The narrative in 1 Chronicles 28 and 29 is more detailed and it needs to be because of the importance of this and it's sort of a parallel account uh, of the one that we have here in first kings and by the way this is if it's of any consolation this means that we're still going to have david in the picture after his death if for no other reason because we're going to be studying these parallel passages and accounts but It's rather interesting that David's final words to Solomon are basically this, man up, as we would say in our day. That's what he's telling. The first thing he says to him is, prove yourself a man. Be a man. Be a man. And prove that you're a man. That's the key word. Now, it's important to understand that Solomon is believed to be only about 16 years old right now. Now think about that. David's probably about 70, it's believed, but this son, Solomon, who is now going to be heir to the throne, is only a teenager, if you think about it, which in some way might explain why David would say what he says. He's telling his teenage son to be a man and prove himself Amen. And here's the thing. He's also telling him how. How to be a man and how to prove that he's a man. How? Well, by keeping God's charge, walking in God's ways, keeping God's statutes, God's commandments, God's judgments, and God's testimonies. That's how. Solomon, be a man, and here's how. Did you catch that? Isn't that interesting? The gauge by which one can measure a real man is by how godly and obedient that man is to the commands of God, simply put. In other words, what David is saying is that a real man is a godly man. And he knows that this is exactly what Solomon will need to be. (laughs) A godly man. A real man. You know what's sad? Solomon will not heed this advice. And the result will be that he'll have to learn this the hard way. And he will not learn this until he's at the end of his own life. In Ecclesiastes, the 12th chapter, verses 13 and 14, he writes of this at the end of his life. He says, verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Here's the wisest man, supernaturally so, who ever lived. And the richest man supernaturally so, who ever lived. And he comes to the end of his life. He has done everything you could possibly imagine. Nothing was withheld from him. Whatever he wanted, he had. And he comes to the end of his life, and what does he say? Here's the conclusion of the whole matter. I've lived it all. I've done it all. Fear God and keep His commandments. Dude, (laughs) 
dad told you that when you were 16. How old are you now? And you're just now coming to that conclusion? That's the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment. And he did in Solomon's life. Including every secret thing. Whether good or evil. Wow. You know, we, we read that. We, we see this. And it's kind of hard to realize the enormity of it and the intensity of it. Think about it this way. If you knew that you could talk to somebody who was so wealthy, I hate to compare it, but wealthier than a Warren Buffett or Bill Gates or et al. Wealthier than that. And you could talk with them and listen to them at the end of their life they were wise and wealthy to just hear what they would say and that's what Solomon would say fear God and keep his commandments well verse 5 moreover now David is still talking to his son on his deathbed Moreover, you know also what Joab, remember Joab? The son of Zeruiah did to me and what he did to the two commanders of the armies of Israel, to Abner the son of Ner and Amasa the son of Jether, whom he killed. Whoa, what about Absalom? He killed Absalom. Oh, but David doesn't mention Joab killing Absalom. I wonder why. Just a thought. Could it be that David realized that even though Joab defied his direct order not to touch his son Absalom, even though he did that, he sees that had he not done that, Absalom could have posed a dangerous threat to Israel, not to mention himself. And so, in a sense, he realizes now, at this point in his life, on his deathbed, that God had allowed it for that reason. In other words, he's not holding that against Joab. However, he is holding against Joab the cold-blooded murder of these two men, these two commanders of the armor, uh, army, Abner, the son of Ner, and Amasa, Remember, David had appointed Amasa to be the, the military commander in place of Joab. And Joab's response, excuse me, I'm the military commander. You got to go, and I'll take care of you, got him to go. And he kills him. And so this is what now David is going to settle with his son Solomon. And he's holding these deaths, these murders to his account. And he shed the blood of war in peacetime and put the blood of war on his belt that was around his waist and on his sandals that were on his feet. Therefore, verse 6, do according to your wisdom. Stop right there. Now, we have not yet got to the point where Solomon has been given that supernatural wisdom. I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but you know the account. When God says to Solomon, anything you want, and instead of asking for wealth, he asks for wisdom. And God says, because you did not ask for wealth, I'm going to give you, and you asked for wisdom, I'm going to give you wisdom and wealth. And he did. And it's really an amazing account when we see his first display of this supernatural wisdom. And it was supernatural wisdom. But isn't it interesting that David would say to Solomon at age 16, I know that you have wisdom. In other words, now stay with me. This is really interesting. And I want us to pay attention to this as we study now the life of Solomon. But why would Solomon, instead of asking for wealth, ask for wisdom? Because he had wisdom. He had wisdom to ask for wisdom. That's wisdom. 
ah, this is why I write things out so I don't say things like that that perhaps don't make any sense. In other words, you have to have wisdom to recognize that if you can have anything you want, it would be more wisdom. It would be foolish to ask for wealth. In other words, the fact that he would ask for wisdom to me is evidence that he possessed wisdom. Are we okay on that? Can we? Okay, just. Okay. And do, this is a wise young man. This is a wise young man. And do not, now he's speaking of Joab, listen. Do not let his gray hair go down to the grave in peace. But, verse 7, show kindness to the sons of Barzillai, the Gileadite. Remember him? When David was fleeing Jerusalem because of Absalom, and he's on the way, and we're told that they were weeping bitterly as they went to run out of Jerusalem to spare the people of the bloodshed that would ensue had they remained. And here comes this Gileadite, not an Israelite, a Gileadite. And this Gileadite helps David. Let me tell you something. In the Arab culture today, my, my culture, and in the Hebrew culture, when you do something for somebody like this, they'll never forget them. They're loyal for the rest of their lives until death. They will never forget it. The ancient Arab people were a nomadic people. They would travel great distances for long periods of time. And if you would take them into your tent and give them water to drink and food to eat, you had in fact saved their lives and they owe you their lives. And that's why today, culturally, the Arab people are amongst the most hospitable people in the world. When you, and we're going to be talking about this, not this Sunday, but Communion Sunday in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, about verses 15 through 22 where Paul is going to talk about partaking of the Lord's table and also partaking of the table of demons. And what he's basically saying is that the Jews in that day would dare not eat at the same table with a Gentile. Why? Because in that culture, and it's that way today, when you break bread with somebody, it's a bond. It's a very intimate bond that is formed and so a Jew would never eat with a Gentile because they don't want that bond with the Gentile and that's why they wouldn't break bread and eat with a Gentile and so it's a very intimate thing this eating together and in fact when you take an Arab in and you feed them and they eat from your table and break bread together with you they're loyal for the rest of their lives so what this Barzillai, the Gileadite did, he basically saved David's life and all of those that were with him. He was a very wealthy man and he fed them. And listen to what he says. And let them be among those who eat at your table. In other words, they fed us. They gave us food to eat, water to drink. For so they came to me when I fled from Absalom your brother. Verse 8 and C. Now there's, this is the third one now that David is telling Solomon that he has to deal with. So first was Joab, then Barzillai, and now you have with you, verse 8, Shimei. <laughs> Remember him? This was the guy that when David was fleeing, <laughs> he cursed him, threw rocks at him, kicked up dust at him, accused him falsely of having blood on his hands and overtaking the throne from Saul, which he never did. In fact, he did the opposite. He could have twice taken Saul's life, didn't. Spared his life. Shimei is accusing him because, interesting, we're told Shimei, the son of Gera, a Benjamite from Bahurim. Ah, Saul was a, a Benjamite. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. See, this guy had self-interest who cursed me with a malicious curse in the day when I went to Mahanaim. Notice the contrast between Shimei who cursed him 
and this Barzillai who fed him and helped him. But he came down, speaking of Shimei, to meet me at the Jordan, and I swore to him by the Lord, saying, now this is on the way back. Remember on the way back when Absalom was killed and David is returning to Jerusalem to take his rightful place back on the throne as God would have it and as God would have had it all along? And <laughs> the Shimei catches wind. Uh-oh. I just got done cursing <laughs> David, and now he's going to, and Absalom is, and I'm dead. I'm dead. And he begs for his life. And David, in the, I'm going to say the heat of the moment, just the emotion of the moment, and, and he tells his men who are saying, David, you just say the word, and I will give you his head. Just say the word. And they're wanting, they're just, I could just picture them with their sword as this Shimei is going, oh, oh, now you're sorry. You know, kind of like here's Shimei and here, you know, here's David going back. And I was just kidding. Can't you take a joke? Oh, my king. Oh, please don't. Kid. And they're like, just say the word. David says, you know what? No. There's been enough bloodshed. How many thousands of men died? because of Absalom's rebellion. There's been enough bloodshed, no. I'm gonna spare his life. And so now, we've got to deal with this. There has to be justice now. And so he says, now therefore, verse nine, do not hold him guiltless. I wanna come back to that, so hang on to that for a second. For you, here it is again, you are a wise man, and know what you ought to do to him, but, Bring his gray hair down to the grave with blood. In other words, do not let him die of old age. What's David doing here? Well, he's settling some unfinished business. Remember a few chapters ago, a few weeks back, when there was a famine in the land for three years, and David sought the Lord, and the Lord answered his inquiry and told him that the reason that there was a famine in the land is because Saul had broken an oath that was made by Joshua to the Gibeonites. That's very interesting. So atonement had to be made. And God would not bless the land because that vow had been broken. Even though it was done in deception, still it had to be honored and the land had to be atoned for. And so that's basically what we see happening here, lest you should think that this is revenge on David's part. It's not revenge. David knows that these men, particularly Joab, pose a threat to his son. He is giving his son wise counsel on what he should do with regards to these men. And he's also making sure that his son makes good on his word, the word he gave to Barzillai the Gileadite. But he's cautioning Solomon concerning Shimei. He knows that this guy could cause him a lot of problems and cause the kingdom a lot of problems. And he's not to be trusted. And he knows that his son is wise and he'll do the right thing. And he's telling him, do not trust him. Do not let him die of old age. You need to deal with him. Well, there's three men here that David wants to settle this unfinished business concerning. And the first one is Joab. That's first on his list. And I think for good reason. He wants to make sure that Solomon makes this right, that justice is served, that he would not die of old age because of the blood on his hand from the cold-blooded murders. And this Barzillai, very interesting David makes sure that he honors his word. You know, to me, it speaks to a couple of things. First, David's character. David, at the end of his life, he wants to equip his son for what he knows lies ahead long after he's gone. He knows who his son's enemies are and that he cannot trust them. And conversely, he knows who Solomon's allies are. And he can, in fact, trust them. Well, verse 10. So David rested with his fathers 
and was buried in the city of David. <laughs> That's it. Verse 11. The period that David reigned over Israel was 40 years. Seven years he reigned in Hebron, and in Jerusalem he reigned 33 years. Which means that, very interesting, because David in a lot of ways is a type of Christ. That he started his reign at the age of 30. That was how old Jesus, the greater than David, the son of David, was when he started his public ministry. Well, it's a little bit astonishing to me, actually, that David's death is mentioned in just a couple of verses. Just, just in passing, and that, that's it, and he dies. I mean, wouldn't you think that more would be written about this man? <laughs> I mean, isn't this David, Israel's greatest king? Isn't this David, the man after God's own heart? Isn't this David, the sweet psalmist of Israel? And that's all? You would think that more would be devoted in writing, in recording of this man's death. But no. There are others heretofore that we've seen, and much was written about their death, and even the mourning because of their death, but not David. That's all we read. And then after this, as we're about to see, Solomon's going to do what his father had told him to do. He's going to take care of business. And he's in a clean house. There's no mourning. There's no... I'm mourning. <laughs> this is... I, I don't... I, I need some time with this. I've been trying to prepare myself for this. I mean, I love David. This is, this is a man that I could follow. This is a man that could be my leader and my example. I like this man. I can't wait to meet this man, and I will, and so will you. So, the question remains, why is it more written about his death? Here's my thought. That's not who David was. Nor is that what David would have wanted. To David's credit, he was merely a man. He was never one to exalt himself, and he was certainly not one to allow others to put him on a pedestal, as it were. For pastors, this is a good example. Because as pastors, this is what happens. People put the pastor up on a pedestal, and I'll tell you, and you probably, as you have gotten to know me over the years, you probably notice that if anybody tries to do that, I will not only jump off that pedestal, I will throw myself on the floor in front of that pedestal so I'm not anywhere near it. Because I know what happens there. I'm just a man. I'm just a donkey. I just like to put it into perspective. If God can speak through a donkey, God can speak through any man. I never want to get romantic about this notion that it has anything to do with me. It does not. It does not. I mean, this is what every pastor should emulate. I like what Ellen Redpath says. He says he was a shepherd, a soldier, an outlaw. We don't like to think of him like that. He was. <laughs> he was a murderer, an adulterer, a king, a fugitive. For a long time he was a fugitive. A sinner, a saint, a poet. His experiences were the writing of God on his life, making him into a man after God's own heart. Alan Red, or, uh, Adam Clark has this to say. He says, in general, he lived well. And it is most evident that he died well. And as a king, a general, a poet, a father. Think about this. He was a... Maybe not the best father. We see that with his kids. But he was a father. And again, to his credit, he's doing the right thing. 
in taking this time to prepare his son, Solomon, for that which lies ahead for him, a father and a friend. He has had few equals and no superior from his own time to the present day. I suppose you could say, there's not another David. There was only one David. And this was a man who had a heart after God's own heart. Verse 12. Then Solomon sat on the throne of his father David, and his kingdom was firmly established. Not because of Solomon, but because of God's covenant and promise to his father David. You know, Solomon, he's going to take the throne. It's going to be firmly established. But his reign will be riddled with disobedient idolatry. That's what we're going to be talking about this Sunday. In verse 14 of 1 Corinthians 10, the Apostle Paul says to the Corinthians, Flee idolatry. (laughs) Flee idolatry. We're going to talk about idolatry in the life of a Christian. We're going to get to know Solomon. And what we're going to find is that he is not his father. He is not like his father David. And in spite of the fact, and this is probably one of the most difficult things to wrap your mind around, in spite of the fact that he possessed such wealth and supernatural wisdom, that in fact may have been his downfall. His wealth and his many wives will end up taking him away from the Lord, he'll start serving other gods until the end of his life when he finally realizes that all was vanity. It was all empty. G. Campbell Morgan of this said, with Solomon began in some senses the most splendid period in Israel's history. Surely it was the grand and glorious building of the temple. The splendor, however, was largely mental and material. The spiritual is noticeably absent. You know what's noticeably absent? There's nowhere where we ever are told that Solomon, like his father, had a heart after God's own heart. There's never... There are no psalms in the entirety of that amazing and wonderful book. Not one psalm. Not one. There's only the practical proverbs because of, not him, the supernatural wisdom that God gave him. It was mental. It was material. But it was not spiritual. Listen, here's the thing. You could caption Solomon's life this way. What shall it profit a man? What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world? Has all the wealth and the wisdom that you could possibly imagine in this world and lose his own soul. If you don't have the spiritual to go with it, of course it's vanity. Of course it's empty. Of course it's unfulfilling. Of course it's unsatisfying. And that was Solomon's life. Well, verse 13. Here comes Adonijah. (laughs) The son of Haggith came to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon. This is not his mother. His mother was the mother of Absalom. This is Absalom's younger brother. So she said, (laughs) this is interesting. Do you come peaceably? (laughs) In other words, what do you want? I don't trust you. What are you doing here? Do you come peaceably? And he said, peaceably. (laughs) Yeah, right. Moreover, verse 14, he said, I have something to say to you. And she said, say it. Then he said, verse 15, you know that the kingdom was mine. And... All Israel had set their expectations on me that I should reign. That's not true. (laughs) However, the kingdom 
has been turned over and has become my brother, speaking of Solomon, for it was his from the Lord. Oh, yeah. Verse 16, now I ask one petition of you, do not deny me. And she said, say it. Then he said, verse 17, please speak to King Solomon, for he will not refuse you, that he may give me Abishag, the Shudamite, as wife. Remember, remember her? David is stricken in years. <laughs> he cannot, he's so old and frail that he cannot stay warm at night. So as was the custom in that day, the physicians, his personal physicians, prescribed this young, beautiful virgin to tend to his needs, not sexually, tend to his needs physically, and lay in bed with him to keep him warm. And that was what they did. And we're told David did not know her, but it's believed that he took her as a concubine, and what we just read would certainly support that. Does this sound eerily similar to what Absalom did? Remember what Absalom did? with David's concubines in public view. See, this is not that this Adonijah wants this young, beautiful woman because she's so beautiful. No, he wants her because she was King David's concubine. You see where he's going with this? This is very clever. He's making a move for the throne. And Solomon, in his wisdom, at 16 years of age, if that's how old he is, he's going to figure that out, as we're about to see. Verse 19, Bathsheba therefore went to King Solomon to speak to him for Adonijah. Why? I don't know. <laughs> and the king rose up to meet her and bowed down to her. This is his mother now. This is the king's mother and sat down on his throne, and had a throne set for the king's mother, so she sat at his right hand. Then, verse 20, she said, I desire one small petition of you, do not refuse me. And the king said to her, ask it, my mother, for I will not refuse you. So, verse 21, she said, let Abishag the Shunammite be given to Adonijah, your brother as wife, your half-brother. And verse 22, <laughs> King Solomon answered and said to his mother, Now why do you ask Abishag the Shunammite for Adonijah? Listen to the sanctified sarcasm in what he says next. Ask for him the kingdom also, <laughs> for he is my older brother for him. And don't stop there for Abiathar the priest and why not even for Joab the son of Zeruiah what's the common denominator with all these guys well <laughs> Joab and Abiathar and th they went with Adonijah in the rebellion against the throne that was to be for Solomon and so <laughs> he sort of sarcastically says to his mother, are you kidding me? You, you, why would you even ask me that? Don't you see what he's doing? He, he wants the throne. Why, why don't you just give him the throne and give it to Joab and give it to Abiathar? They all wanted Adonijah on the throne. They sided with him against me and your husband, David the king. Now watch verse 23. Then King Solomon swore by the Lord, saying, this was very common, very customary, as the Lord lives, as we would say today, as God is my witness, <laughs> you know, may God do so to me and more also if Adonijah has not spoken this word against his own life. Yes. Now, there, that's not, that was not very nice, was it? <laughs> I, this, I don't like this guy. I don't like, I've met Adonijah's, in my, not here, on the mainland, not here. <laughs> I've met my fair share 
of Adonijah's. I'm very familiar with who Adonijah is. They're very cunning. They're very evil. They are very narcissistic. And some I would even suggest are sociopathic and psychopathic. They're psychopath. They're narcissistic psychopaths. And that's different. You can be a psychopath and a narcissist, but to be a narcissistic psychopath, oh. uh, Listen, I, anyway. Verse 24, Now therefore, as the Lord lives, who has confirmed me and set me on the throne of David my father, and who has established a house for me as he promised, Adonijah shall be put to death today. Today. So King Solomon sent by the hand of Benaniah, the son of Jehoiada, and he struck him down and he died. Good for you. Good for you. I know that sounds mean, but good for him. <laughs> this is the second attempt, right? <laughs> Wait a minute. Is this not what Solomon said? Okay. I'll be gracious to you. I'll show you mercy. I'll spare your life trying to take the throne, launch a rebellion, and do what you did. Uh, uh, but if you so much as, I mean even, just even, even a hint that you're going to try this again, I'm going to have you put to death. Don't even think about it. And we're, we're going to see this uh, here pretty soon, but that's exactly what he said. Now, Stay with me on this, because you would think that after Adonijah had been shown such mercy, I mean, think about it, he, his life was spared. He could have been put to death right then and there, and he wasn't, and Solomon spared his life. You would think he would be so grateful, he wouldn't even so much as ever think about it again. Why would he do this? Why in the world would he try this a second time, knowing that it could mean certain death? I have a thought. Here it is. I believe that Adonijah, who's the older brother, how much older? I don't know. But older than Solomon, and as such, he thought he could actually pull it off. Because Solomon's just a kid. He's just my baby kid half-brother. He's only a teenager. He's only a youth. Reminds me of what the Apostle Paul said to Timothy in his first epistle. Here's this young pastor. And he's being intimidated because he's young. And what does Paul say? Let no one despise your youth. But be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Verse 26. And to Abiathar the priest, the king said, Go to Anathoth, to your own fields, for you are deserving of death. But, and this is interesting, I will not put you to death at this time. And here's why. Because you carried the ark of the Lord God before my father David, and because you were afflicted every time my father was afflicted. He was loyal to David. So Solomon, not to Solomon. So verse 27, Solomon removed Abiathar from being priest to the Lord, that he might fulfill the word of the Lord, which he spoke concerning the house of Eli at Shiloh. Uh, that was way back, that there would not be a priest that would come. Verse 28 then, News came to Joab. Uh-oh. <laughs> do you think he knows it's coming? I do. He knows it's coming. For Joab had defected to Adonijah, though he had not defected to Absalom. So Joab fled, <laughs> you coward, to the tabernacle of the Lord and took hold of the horns of the altar. And verse 29, King Solomon was told, Joab has fled to the tabernacle of the Lord. There he is by the altar. Then Solomon sent Benaniah, the son of Jehoiada, saying, Go strike him down. <laughs> verse 30, So Benaniah went to the tabernacle of the Lord and said to him, Thus says the king, Come out 
And he said, No, <laughs> but I will die here. And Benaiah brought back word to the king, saying, Thus said Joab, and thus he answered me. Then, verse 31, the king said to him, Do as he has said, and strike him down, and bury him, that you may take away from me, and listen to this, and from the house of my father, the innocent blood which Joab shed. This is justified. This is just. This is because of what he, the shedding of innocent blood, which is again what Saul did in breaking the oath that Joshua had made with the Gibeonites. Innocent blood was shed and atonement had to be made. This is just. This is not arbitrary. This is not revenge. So verse 32, the Lord will return his blood on his head because he struck down two men more righteous and better than he. Again, Absalom is not mentioned. And killed them with the sword. Abner, the son of Ner, the commander of the army of Israel, and Amasa, the son of Jether, the commander of the army of Judah, though my father David did not know it. Their blood, verse 33, shall therefore return upon the head of Joab and upon the head of his descendants forever. But upon David and his descendants, upon his house and his throne, there shall be peace forever from the Lord. So verse 34, Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, went up and struck and killed him, and he was buried in his own house in the wilderness. The king, verse 35, put Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, in his place over the army, and the king put Zadok, the priest, in the place of Abiathar. Then verse 36, the king sent and called for Shimei. This one is even better than Joab. I can't wait for this one, okay? And said to him, build yourself a house in Jerusalem and dwell there and do not go out from there anywhere. He's going to give him a chance. I, I, in some ways you might almost say that he's just going to give him enough rope to hang himself. He's going to give him one test. He knows he will not pass the test. And he says to him, Build yourself a house in Jerusalem and dwell there and do not go out from there anywhere. For it shall be, verse 37, on the day you go out and cross the brook Kidron, know for certain you shall surely die. Your blood shall be on your own head. You should be dead. And Shimei said to the king, the saying is good. <laughs> you think? You just got your life spared again. Not for long. <laughs> the saying is good, as my lord the king has said, so your servant will do. <laughs> so Shimei dwelt in Jerusalem many days. Now, verse 39, it happened at the end of three years that two slaves of Shimei ran away to Achish, the son of Maacah, the king of Gath, and they told Shimei, saying, Look, your slaves are in Gath. So Shimei, verse 40, arose, saddled his donkey, and went to Achish at Gath to seek his slaves. Uh-oh. And Shimei went and brought his slaves from Gath. And Solomon was told that Shimei had gone from Jerusalem to Gath and had come back. Okay. Then the king, oh, this is good, sent and called for Shimei and said to him, uh, excuse me, that's not in the original, but that's, I'm just going to put that in there. Excuse me. <laughs> Did I not make you swear by the Lord and warn you, saying, No, for a certain, that on the day you go out and travel anywhere, you shall surely die? And you said to me, The word I have heard is good. Why, verse 43 then, have you not kept the oath of the Lord and the commandment that I gave you. He cannot say, I forgot. This is deliberate. I don't know how clear you can be. And I don't care that it's been, th oh, wow, that was so long ago. I, I forgot. I'll tell you why you didn't forget. Because you'll never forget when someone spares your life. You don't forget things like that. You can forget 
what you had for breakfast the other week, but you don't forget when someone spared your life. <laughs> you can forget the, the sermon the pastor preached. I know not you, other uh, you know, people in other churches. They forget the sermon the pres- pastor preached, but you don't forget when somebody <laughs> saves your life or spares your life. He cannot say that, and he doesn't. Verse 44. The king said moreover to Shimei, You know, as your heart acknowledges, all the wickedness that you did to my father David, there, and by the way, when he cursed David, that was a capital crime. And that's back in Exodus. That if you curse the king, you shall be put to death. It was, man, that's a deterrent. <laughs> that's a, <laughs> we, you know, we could use some of that in this day and age. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. I, I never forget, it was a while back, and I know I'm digressing, but just hang in there with me. Um, it was a while back when, I think it was in, might have been Japan, or it was, I forget where it was, but a young teenager had, um, was tagging, you know, graffiti. Uh, was, uh, you know, doing graffiti on a, a building and he got arrested and I forget the, the punishment was something like he got beaten like whipped you know so many times and had to I mean the, the, the punishment was so severe and they, didn't all, they do not have problems with graffiti in that area as you might imagine right? It's a deterrent. And by the way, is this not what Solomon is doing here? I mean, he's setting a precedent, isn't he? he he's, he's cleaning. If he didn't do this, when he did this, at this stage, then his whole reign would have been marked by rebellion and those who were would try, Joab would have made his life miserable. Adonijah would have made his life miserable. Shimei would have made his life miserable. And they would have all, they would not have had respect. There was a reverent fear, you might say. This was a deterrent. Oh, this guy means business. This guy means, this is not just any old 16 year old that is taking the throne from his father. This, this guy means business. And it would set a precedent for his entire reign. This guy means business. Well, verse 45, but King Solomon shall be blessed. He's just basically pronounced this curse on Shimei for what he did to his father, a crime punishable by death. But verse 45, King Solomon shall be blessed in the throne of David shall be established before the Lord forever, and it will. So the king commanded Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and he went out and struck him down, and he died. Thus the kingdom was established in the hand of Solomon. Kind of a bloody start to his reign, but it really needed to be. But I don't know if you notice throughout this whole ordeal that there was this common denominator with all that Solomon did here. And what I'm speaking of is, and you see it there on the screen is, he erred on the side of grace. He could have very justifiably put Joab to death immediately. He could have very justifiably put Shimei to death immediately, but he didn't. He erred on the side of grace in his dealings. And maybe this is one takeaway along with maybe many takeaways such that in our dealings with people you can never go wrong by erring on the side of grace. You can never go wrong. I never regret in all of my years, especially in ministry, I never regret erring on the side of grace. And here's a young man. And again, to David's credit, these final parting words to his son. You know, the last words to my 
from my father, which I didn't realize it at the time. My wife and I, this is 1994, August 14th, I'll never forget it. August 13th was a Saturday night. My wife and I were on our way to church prayer. We had our meetings on Saturday night, our prayer meetings. This is before kids. <laughs> we had time then to go to prayer meetings. And... Um, my dad was in the hospital and I stopped by to see him and I did not know that would be the last time I would see my father alive. And as I was leaving, he said to me, son, I am proud of you. I love you and God bless you. I didn't realize it at the time, but I had just gotten the blessing from my father as was the custom in that day. And you know, my life has been very blessed. And one of the things I'm trying to impart to my sons is that the one thing you can do above anything else is honor your father and your mother. It's the only commandment that has a blessing attached to it. So that the days upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee may be long and blessed and fulfilled. I memorized that commandment. My parents made me. But anyway, <laughs> I can still uh, to this day uh, recite that uh, commandment. And I'll tell you, Solomon was blessed because he honored his father. He honored his father's wishes there on his deathbed. And his kingdom was established very firmly forever because of it. But the one thing that I, I do think is uh, admirable concerning Solomon with all of his, you know, uh, sins and errors. He was a gracious man. But his father was a gracious man. David was a very gracious man. I have never regretted erring on the side of grace. I have always regretting, regretted not erring on the side of grace. You can never go wrong. Why don't you stand? We'll pray. Lord, thank you so much kind of a gnarly chapter again and we're off to a <laughs> sort of a bloody start but I'm kind of glad we got that out of the way now we can kind of move on and Joab's out of the picture and Adonijah's out of the picture and Shimei's out of the picture and, and rightfully so. Lord there's so much that we can learn from this account that we have and really this book and all that follows. So Lord, again, thank you so much for your word. And Lord, just enable us by the Holy Spirit to take home with us a truth, an applicable truth that we can apply to our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.